morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to this first webinar on reimagining manufacturing, the first of a series um, that will be delivering results and, um, and having in-depth uh, conversations around manufacturing. This first one is on mainstreaming gender and inclusion. The research that will be discussed in this study was carried out by the International Center for Research on Women in collaboration with the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. I am your moderator. I am Cleopatra Mujenyi, and I am the director for ICRW Africa. I would like to introduce our speakers today. Giving remarks are Dr. Sarah Kambu, who is the CEO and president of ICRW, she has been uh, working with ICRW for over 18 years and has over three decades uh, of, of experience carrying out research. She has served as a, an advisor to multilaterals, leading corporations and governments seeking to integrate gender into policies and programs. She has worked in Asia, Eastern Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa and in Washington DC. And in December 2012, was appointed to the President's Global Development Council by President Barack Obama, as well as a former President Bill Clinton nominated her to serve as an advisor to the Clinton, Clinton Global Health Initiative. In 2010, uh, US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton appointed Sarah to represent ICRW on the US Commission to UNESCO. Welcome, Sarah. Our, our, Next speaker after that is uh, Phyllis Wakiaga, who is the ex Chief Executive Officer for the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. She is a Kenyan lawyer and corporate executive and has been the Chief Executive Officer for the Kenya Association of Manufacturers for, for the last five years. She began her career at Kenya Airways and then moved on to, <clears throat> to Kenya Association of Manufacturers. And she is also the chair of the Kenya Private Sector Alliance Industry Trade Cooperative Sector Board, and also serves as the board chair of the Global Compact Network Kenya, as well as a, being a board member for the Kenya Electricity Generating uh, Company here in Kenya. Welcome, Phyllis. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Cleopatra. It's such a pleasure to be here today with yourself and with Phyllis and with everyone who has joined us online for this webinar so that we could share the findings of our report, Reimagining Re Manufacturing, Mainstreaming Gender and Inclusion. I'd really like to thank our partners, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, as well as the financial and technical support provided by the Business Advocacy Fund. Without their support, our research and this report would not have been possible. In almost every country of the world, men are more likely to participate in labor markets than women. In fact, globally, only 63% of women aged 25 to 54 participate in the labor market as compared to 94% of men. This gap is often perpetuated by social expectations and restricted opportunities for women and girls. The manufacturing sector is no exception, with women being underrepresented and with fewer chances for advancement and promotion into management and leadership positions. This underrepresentation comes at a cost. Evidence has shown that when women do not participate in the workforce, there is a negative impact on local, national and global economies. Women make up half of the world's population, limiting their access to quality education, including STEM and opportunities for professional development, limits the diversity, talent, talent resilience and return on investment for the entire workforce. At ICRW, we believe that gender transformative business environments are not only essential for development and sustainability, but also good for business. And as investors recognize how gender considerations are related to the bottom line, gender smart investing is making its way into the mainstream. 
In order to tip the scales, it's vital that we understand the challenges that women face in manufacturing, remove the barriers to success, and ensure more equitable outcomes. ICRW is excited to partner with the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, who has been a key stakeholder in the country's manufacturing sector for over 60 years. This partnership has enabled us to present the first research of its kind in Kenya. And what we do here in Kenya could set the tone for other countries in the region. Sustainable growth and human development can only be achieved if there is meaningful participation of women in the economy. With this research, at this moment in time, we can take a step in the right direction. As I look at the other panelists today, it's clear that things are looking pretty good for the manufacturing sector in Kenya. And now, with thanks to Cleo and the entire ICRW Africa team for some fantastic research, I'm delighted to hand over to our partner, Phyllis Wakiaga, the Chief Executive Officer for Kenya Association of Manufacturers, and ask you, Phyllis, to please introduce the report to our audience. Thank you very much. So the Women in Manufacturing report is a very important step in this process. As we are aware, women face unique structural, cultural, and historical challenges that hinder them from entering the sector and scaling their businesses. Some of them are stuck in the informal economy and are unable to formalize for sustainability of their businesses. From the Women in Manufacturing report, women are sidelined in the manufacturing sector with a majority of industries being predominantly male-owned and staffed. Actually, out of the report, we noted that only three of the 14 sectors have a female workforce of over 40%. Through the Women in Manufacturing program, which you'll hear more about uh, when the chair speaks later, uh, we aim to provide practical solutions and to gain tangible results. When we set up the Women in Manufacturing program, we knew that we require data to be able to drive this agenda forward. And this is what informed our decision to undertake this study, which shall inform our advocacy strategy to mainstream equality and inclusion in the manufacturing sector. The findings shall also guide us to bring viable solutions to the challenges facing women in manufacturing, which shall also inspire more women to venture into the uncharted territory that is the manufacturing sector. As the Association of Manufacturers, we will continue to engage the government and other stakeholders to aid in the recovery of the manufacturing sector and the economy. And as businesses try to navigate the different challenges brought about by the pandemic, we will also ensure that the findings of this report are implemented by the different stakeholders so that we carry this agenda beyond the report. Thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to a very fruitful session this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. Uh, I'll now go on to introduce our great panelists. If you can move to the next slide. Uh, Ms. Flora Mutahi is the founder and CEO of Melvin's Marsh International Limited. And Melvin's Marsh is the producer of um, Melvin's Tea, which is Kenya's first flavored tea brand. And uh, Flora, uh, founded Melvin's, um, Melvin Marsh International in 1995. So she is a, she is a long-standing uh, woman manufacturer here in, in Kenya. And she is also, as Phyllis mentioned, the current chair of the Women in Manufacturing Caucus um, in the Kenya Association of Manufacturers and the a uh, former chairperson of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, where she was actually the first, uh, the first female chairperson at CAM. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Ms. Margaret Komen, who is the founder and managing director of Mace Foods Limited. And she is a food technologist and she is recognized in Kenyan women business circles as an expert in applying entrepreneurship skills and concepts that are relevant for small and medium enterprises. Welcome, uh, Margaret. Ms. Irene Wanjiku is the founder and MD of Rex Roofing Kenya, 
Uh, she is uh, in the construction sector, very unusual for a woman, um, as we're all aware. So she has been breaking barriers with, uh, with uh, her, roofing, uh, her roofing company, and it has become a leading brand that has transformed uh, Africa's skyline. Welcome, Irene. Our next panelist is uh, Ms. Tajal Dohia, who is the managing director of Thika Clothing Mills. And she has held this position since 2011. Uh, Thika Clothing Mills is a, fam a, is a family owned and run business, one of L Kenya's leading fully integrated textile manufacturers with spinning, weaving and processing capabilities. Tajal is passionate about the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya initiative value chains and development and, in, and empowering youth and gender equity. Tajal, welcome. Next slide, please. Our, our next panelist is Naomi, Ms. Naomi Ndele, who is an SME banking specialist who has 20 years of progressive experience in business banking, consumer and affluent banking, sales marketing, and is a recognized expert in driving sustainable growth of, um, of the field of SME banking and agribusiness. She works for one of the leading financial institutions in the region and is very passionate about financial inclusion for the unbanked and underbanked um, and champions the delivery of seamless trusted customer propositions for this uh, special populations. And uh, Naomi has held numerous technical roles within banking and hospitality and, uh, and is well recognized for her role in empowering women and developing products for, for women. Welcome, Naomi. Ms. Betty Mugo is a gender and inclusivity specialist who works with USAID, Kenya, and East Africa. She is a passionate and committed gender and social inclusion specialist and has been with USAID since 2011. She leads, coordinates, and plans, designs, and manages gender strategies and programs across a whole host of thematic areas. Uh, she, is, uh, she is passionate about gender. For all the years that I've known Betty, uh, wherever, wherever there's a conversation, Betty will bring, will bring gender front and foremost to it. So um, she, is, um, she also has previous experience with the Canadian International Development Agency and, um, and, has, and has played uh, key, gender, key gender roles and, and provided expertise on a number of working groups and committees here in Kenya and East Africa. Our, our final um, panelist or presenter is Ms. Saren Duta, who is a gender and technical specialist at ICRW. And she is one of the key team members who actually carried out this research. She has over 10 years experience in gender mainstreaming, inclusion, women's economic empowerment and health and responsible uh, for designing and undertaking both qualitative and quantitative research that aims at gender mainstreaming and inclusion. Uh, she has worked extensively with youth in health and on gender issues and was very excited to move into the field of manufacturing and women in non-traditional sectors. Welcome Duta. We have an apology from one of our panelists, Dr. Jemima Njuki. She unfortunately uh, is unable to join us today, but will be joining us at one of our future lectures. Next slide, please. So women in manufacturing, this is the report. Uh, we've put it, we're flashing it up here on screen so that uh, you can see what it looks like. And there's a link uh, at the bottom of the screen. Uh, you can always follow that. And our colleague, Joe, has also put it in the chat box. Um, as Phyllis said, the Women in Manufacturing uh, study was, um, was implemented towards the end of 2019 and into 2020. And uh, we released the report uh, on the 15th of September, a couple of weeks ago. So following that successful launch, uh, we knew that because this is the first study of its kind, it's important to get the word out there about the challenges, the opportunities, and the status of women in manufacturing. Next slide. As we know, there. Thank you. As we know, there are few women in this in this field, and and we want to see how we can actually increase their participation um, in the sector. So just a quick outline, we will be talking about manufacturing, gender, the re return on investment, women in the economy, leadership and ownership, 
women's participation in manufacturing, there'll be recommendations and then we'll have questions and answers. And our panelists will be involved in, in the different uh, parts of this uh, presentation. Next slide. Next slide. So as we know that, uh, as we know, there, the participation of women, and as, as has already been stated, uh, in, global, in global labor markets is lower than that of men. And when we look at it even further, the, the actual ent entrepreneurship of women is even less than that, than, than actual participation in labor markets. We find that women entrepreneurs there are actually 40% of global um, economies that have fewer than 50% female entrepreneurs than men. And when, and when we look at that, we begin to realize that there are a whole host of challenges that uh, women are facing to set up their own enterprises, grow their enterprises and, um, and access markets. What it, but why, why do we need to actually include women fully in the labor markets, as well as as well as in sectors like manufacturing, that are uh, traditionally the domains of men. We've seen that from a 2019 uh, study by ILO that gender balanced boards are 20% more likely to have enhanced business outcomes, and gender inclusive cultures are 9% more likely to have improved business performance. And as seen on this slide, we find that gender inclusive cultures will lead to increased enhanced company reputation, enhanced ability to attract and retain talent, better ability to gauge uh, co consumer interest and demand, because as we know, 50 women make up almost 50% of the, of the uh, population and, uh, and are generally the decision makers when it comes to what to consume for the household. And including women uh, and having a diverse workforce actually leads to greater creativity, innovation, and openness. So there is a strong, a strong um, evidence base for including women in, in labor forces and actively working towards bringing them on board in sectors where they may not be as, um, as active. Next slide. So when we we drill down to manufacturing. As Phyllis did say, manufacturing is a key pillar of economic growth. And the rate of growth of the manufacturing sector actually has both direct and indirect impacts on the growth of other sectors in the economy. So it's very important for us to, to look at manufacturing um, as, as a driver for even more economic growth and the growth of other sectors. We know that 55% of the global labor force are women, but only 22% of the manufacturing labor force are women. And, this, and we're saying the manufacturing labor force is a, is a smaller proportion of the global labor force. And in Kenya, even though there has been an, an increase and an improvement and a, and a growth in the manufacturing sector, only in 2019, only 17% of women were formerly employed in the manufacturing sector. So while there is growth in the sector in Kenya, we find that that growth does not translate into, into formal jobs for women or into opportunities for entrepreneurship. So this study really is to look at the status of women in manufacturing as it stands here in Kenya, to understand what their challenges are, to see what we can do to improve their participation in, in this sector. Next slide. So very briefly, the study objectives were really to de determine the extent of women's ownership and leadership, to establish the challenges facing women in manufacturing, to assess policy legislative and institutional frameworks, and also to provide recommendations for mainstreaming gender equality and inclusion. And now we're going to go into the study findings. Next slide, please. Over to you, Nduta. Thank you very much, Cleopatra. I will take us through the first set of findings from the study. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we begin by looking at the frameworks that uh, govern women in manufacturing, and these are the legal and legislative frameworks. We undertook an extensive review of the policy and legal frameworks that target the promotion and uh, equality diversity with, uh, with regards to gender, with the name of um, increasing uh, 
the women participation in workforce at both global and local context. Uh, we found that Kenya has ratified a number of frameworks at both global and regional levels, and even at local. And uh, some of these include the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of uh, Discrimination Against Women, this is the CEDO, that has provisions on equal participation um, of women and uh, speaks against discrimination of women in terms of uh, provisions for equal employment, equal remuneration, training opportunities, promotions, paid maternity leave, and uh, uh, such a kind of provisions. Uh, another um, document that we looked at was the Convention on the Discrimination by the International Labor Organization, which is the reference point for uh, the right to non-discrimination at work for both men and women. Uh, at the regional level, we have the Maputo Protocol among other protocols. And the Maputo Pro Protocol uh, specifically provides um, against uh, provisions with regards to uh, non-discrimination and requires that state parties or uh, countries that have ratified it to legislate and enforce laws to guarantee women equal opportunities within the work, within career advance, advancement, and within other economic opportunities. And there are many other global and regional uh, policies that we have included in the report. Uh, so we found that Kenya has made strides with regards to the development of these policies and registrations on a number of areas. Uh, but um, these policies, in as much as they are aimed to promote gender equality and participation of both men and women within the economic endeavors, but like we can see on this table that is on our screen, most of the laws are actually gender neutral, uh, which means that they recognize gender issues but do not do anything about them. And so they tend to uh, reinforce gender inequalities. Within our review, only two frameworks were actually gender transformative for the Kenyan context. And this is our constitution of 2010 and the Pub Public Procurement and Asset Disposal Act which allows women to provide 30% of procurement um, activities, activities within the government. Uh, it's important to note that Kenya's constitution is referred to as a very progressive document because of the certain provisions that uh, are included. For example, the two thirds gender rule. However, uh, the composition of leadership um, at all levels has had disparities. And uh, since we promulgated this constitution in 2010, we are now 10 years down the line, and uh, we still have not been able to achieve this as a country. And this could be a reflection of what is happening in so many other countries. Uh, so this has remained a heated debate in our country and in other various spaces. Uh, and our results have shown that uh, despite the existence of these frameworks, they have not really translated to the equal participation of women in manufacturing and also, also in other sectors. Uh, next, please. Thank you. We also wanted to understand the place of women in the economy. And uh, within the study, we found that 84% of Kenya's workforce are engaged in the informal economy with up to 90% of jobs being created within that sector. Uh, and micro, small, and uh, medium enterprises having uh, employment of up to 15 million Kenyans. Importantly, is that 93% of women-owned businesses are actually within the informal sector. And this is a question for us as to uh, why women do not actually want to formalize businesses. Uh, we also found that manufacturing firms within the informal economy make up up to 23% of the sector. But then again, only 48% of these have been licensed. Uh, and so uh, from our study, we found that there are many challenges with informality within our country. And this could be a reflection of many other countries. Uh, and these challenges include uh, the lack of access to finance, access to technology, access to markets, access to accreditation of products and other, other facilities that would come along with, uh, with the formalization. Thank you, and uh, back to you, Cleo. 
Thank you, Njita. So there are real issues here around informality. And even though we have uh, laws and regulatory frameworks in, in Kenya that should, be, um, that should be beneficial to women in business, that doesn't tend to be the case. Uh, like Njuta has said, we only have uh, two, two major uh, legal frameworks that are gender transformative. A lot of the legal frameworks that govern the work that, that women are doing in manufacturing are, are basically gender neutral. And, um, and there are huge, huge uh, issues about informality. Now, at the moment, uh, we don't have Flora yet, but I'd like to ask Phyllis uh, about issues to do with informality, especially from CAM. So what challenges are we seeing with uh, women who are running uh, informal uh, manufacturing enterprises? And, um, and, what is, and what can be done to formalize uh, these, um, these small uh, and micro, small and medium enterprises? Thank you. Over to you, Phyllis. I think we may have a connection issue with Phyllis. So I'm going to move on to my next question and I will come back to Phyllis. Betty, you've heard a lot about this informality and with 93% of women owned businesses actually in the informal, in the informal um, economy, I'd like to know a bit more about what development partners are seeing as the biggest obstacle to formalization and what they're doing to increase formalization of women's enterprises. Over to you, Betty. Thank you very much, uh, Cleo. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is an honor to participate in this virtual session on behalf of the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, Kenya, and East Africa. And I'm also very much pleased to be in the company of many inspiring Kenya women manufacturers. I'm very proud of the work that you're all doing. And thank you very much uh, for being torch bearers to young girls uh, in Kenya. Uh, I would also like to congratulate uh, Kenya Association of Manufacturers and the International Center for Research on Women uh, for developing this first ever Women in Manufacturing Report. This resource is great uh, in terms of uh, being useful to all of us uh, as, as a reference uh, for the work that we do. To the question that you ask, uh, I think based on even what uh, the report is already uh, showcasing is that one of the biggest uh, challenges to informality is really the size of the enterprises uh, because many enterprises are still very micro and small. And so because of that size and because of the restrictive regulatory and policy uh, environment in which they are all operating, it means that they are not able to grow and they're not able to expand. As a result of the size also, it becomes very difficult for them to access uh, the resources that they need for purposes, purposes of expansion, uh, for purposes of growth, for being able to tap into uh, technology and innovation that already exist. So the biggest challenge we really have is really the size, uh, but also the restrictive uh, uh, environment uh, in which this uh, operate. Uh, let me say that uh, USAID is very much committed uh, in uh, empowering Kenyan women and girls to reach their full potential. And uh, the work that we continue to do as partners with Kenya uh, allows us also to invest in this particular area. I'll speak very quickly uh, about one of the initiatives that uh, USAID uh, is uh, supporting. The US government is committed uh, to investing in women's economic empowerment and entrepreneurship. And one of the flagship initiatives that we have is the Women Global and Prosperity Initiative uh, in short, WGDP. Now, WGDP was established in 2019 uh, by President Trump to increase the women's economic empowerment globally through three pillars. Women prospering in the workplace, uh, women um, succeeding as entrepreneurs, and women enabled in the economy. Now, enabling women in the economy will be addressing the restrictive uh, policy and regulatory framework that you've already identified in this report. So this is one of the areas that USAID is invested in and the US government is invested in. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. And it's good to hear that we're actually seeing more investment into, um, enter into women's enterprises and also thinking about the growth from micro to, to medium and small. So 
to Margaret. In your subsector of agribusiness, where you get your raw materials from many informal producers, how have you come? How have you overcome these challenges of, of informality in your supply chain? Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. It's really a pleasure to be part of this uh, session today. Um, straight to your question. As you may be aware, the in agribusiness, you it depends on the model that uh, that is used to to source the the, the raw materials. In many instances, um, in more than eighty percent of the time, the suppliers of the raw material are, as you mentioned, small scale farmers or people in the rural areas in with really informal structures, and uh, this really poses a, a big challenge to if you are. Um, aggregator or a processing uh, facility like ours that where you have to collect all this raw material and put it together. Uh, what we, the model we chose to use was um, this uh, small scale farmers model and it involves um, creating uh, small holder groups and then getting them registered and um, getting them uh, trained to understand exactly the industry they are serving. This is a very difficult uh, task, but there is no, there is very little you can do if you want to get the, the right product. So for, for this sector, the only way is to get the, the groups or the farmers or the producers organized into formal groups, registered uh, and trained to understand how to, to do the, long, the, the, the right job. It takes a long, long time. Uh, in our case, it has taken 18 years to build these structures, but in the long run, it, it pays off. Thank you, Margaret. And yes. Naomi, the next question is, is over to you. Uh, we've had Margaret talk about uh, some of the challenges that, uh, that are faced in the agribusiness sector, especially when you're thinking of your value and supply chains. And, um, and Betty has, uh, has alluded to issues around uh, access to resources. So we'd be interested to hear about in, the, in banks and financial institutions, how are, how are you actually responding to the issue of informality? especially since manufacturing is a capital intensive sector. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Cleopatra. And um, indeed, I am honored to be a part of this panel. And uh, just to um, uh, confirm and to reiterate what Betty and uh, Margaret have said, indeed, the, the, the sector, the women are not part of the um, the manufacturing sector in a big way. Indeed, uh, we it is evident even from a financial institution uh, context that women shy away from this sector because it is very complex and it is very capital intensive. And so um, there, there is need for a lot of knowledge when it comes to how to run a successful manufacturing business. And uh, we realize that a lot of women also lack in that, in that area. So um, from a, a financial institution um, point of view, we see the, the, the problem of informality uh, arising from um, broadly two issues. One, um, non-financial uh, in the sense that there is a, limited knowledge uh, from on the women's side on how to run these businesses. And in that sense, they are uh, unable to scale up their businesses to the extent that they are able to um, raise enough capital uh, to grow them and also um, raise the, the required requirements uh, from a banking perspective that will enable them access uh, capital to uh, enable them grow. So that is the, the, the bit about the non-financial bit, but also um, from a behavior uh, point of view, men and women think very differently. And, um, and not just thinking, they do things differently in the sense that men will interpret information given to them uh, by elimination. So they, they pick what they think is relevant to them but women um, usually interpret information by integration. So they take it and try to pick, fit themselves within that information. Um, 
and and with that then that they it's they become slow in the way they they make their decisions they 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 also um take time to understand that information which more often than not they do not have that uh, length of time uh, to required to make the decisions that will enable them move forward and grow their businesses. So if there's behavioral um, limitations, there is um, knowledge limitations um, resulting to this informality. Um, and so when it comes to the financial bit, um, uh, the, the informality comes in in the sense that for you to access a good uh, sizable amount of credit, you require to uh, provide uh, quite a number of um, of, uh, of requirements. Basically, you there's regulatory requirements. Maybe you need to have licenses. You need to have uh, registrations, and um, these kind of things cost uh, money. And you'll find that. Uh, the women businesses do not have that capacity to raise funds to, 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 to put in place these requirements. There's also the bit about um, uh, having the, the prerequisite documentation. For example, they will be required to have audited accounts. And again, uh, that uh, requirement requires that they hire a professional to do the audited accounts. And more often than not, they do not have that uh, uh, capability financially to, to hire these professionals to do uh, this kind of work. So these are some of the things that cause the women to remain in that space of uh, running their businesses in a more informal way compared to the men. Thank you, Naomi. And you've touched on a whole host of, of, of issues that we will, be, we, may, we will be going into in a bit more detail um, in this webinar. I see we have uh, Flora Mutahi, our, um, our other panelist. Uh, Flora, if you're there, I'd like to direct a, a question to you, uh, jumping straight into it. Uh, Margaret, uh, Betty, and uh, Naomi have all touched on issues of informality. Uh, with you having been um, in manufacturing for 25 years and in your role as uh, the chair of WIM, uh, as well as the former chairperson of CAM, uh, what, what specific challenges beyond um, low risk tolerance, um, um, access to, to uh, uh, collateral and some of the other issues that, uh, that, the, that the other speakers mentioned. What, what other issues are you seeing around informality, especially now as we move into the, into the 20, as we are in the 21st century and, and in light of industry 4.0? Thank you, Flora. Over to you. Okay, Flora, you're muted. You may, you may need to unmute yourself. Okay, I think I think we're Hello. there. You Hi. are. <laughs> Hello, Flora. Hi. Did you um, hear the question? You could just give me one. Yeah, you could just give me one minute. Okay. It's okay. Um. Hello, Flora. Are you there? Oh, there yes, you I are. Am. Yes, I am. Good sorry, to see you. Sorry, I'm having to, to borrow an office. Okay, I'm here. So, okay. You asked a question around informality. Yes. And I, do you mean what I faced or what I see? What you see, what you faced uh, from your 25 years in experience, that would also be great. I think the audience would like to hear that. All right. I think one of the, the issues um, women face is really around, um, well, like she mentioned, um, access to just, I think first of all is knowledge. When you want to start a manufacturing um, company, you, you need to know this is the area I want to go into. Then you need to know this is the machinery I want to get into. And when I look at my journey, how I began is, um, you know, when I thought I want to get into manufacturing, I was not even sure what it was. I drove myself to a, to a, you know, a learning institution. I went to Kabeta campus. And I met a professor and I introduced myself and said, I want to go into food. I didn't study food science, but 
I want to know the, the theory behind it. And we spent um, three weeks where he, every afternoon, he literally took me through what it means to manufacture food. And then I told him I wanted, I started with free flowing soil for Melvins and we did, we walked that journey together. So look at a, a lady in the informal sector, would they be able to know this? First of all, it's not even knowing, it's perhaps do they have access to a learning institution or somebody who can give them assistance? When I came to writing out my business plan, because then I didn't have money and I went to an institution that said, don't talk to us if you don't have a business plan. I had a friend who was an economist, so I was able to use him. So another challenge women face. So let's, 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 so it's about, you know, access to even the information. Then when I needed to start making machinery, I found an organization, a, B, a BMO, that actually was um, um, helping SMEs um, engineer uh, so that you can have your machinery made. So I went and told them, this is what I need. And they did that. So again, um, access to information, um, you know, they're not, they're not members of business services. I was still young living at home, but I assume I was married and in, 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 a home, in a homestead and I'm informal. Do I have the resources to be able to lead my children and, and go and look for the, you know, get the time to, 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 to register in a BMO? So those are the sort of challenges you tend to find informality dealing with, lack of support services, lack of information. When I went to look for my markets, of course, um, you know, I know what is... Um, what was out there. So I drove myself to supermarket, but I was making somebody laugh. I went around the supermarkets and I thought that was it. But no, you know, there's a whole other, other a whole other area in, um, in um, what do you call it? You know, the general trade, the wholesalers, the distributors. And this is the, something that came to me later. So I tend to think in informality and I can see people on, on the group sharing a little bit more. Um, there, is, there is a lot that these women actually lack. And this is why they don't, they don't um, formalize. Let's also not mention the cost of formalization. You know, um, once you have an organization, I have a book outside, I mean, in the industrial area, and it got to a stage where I'll tell the, you know, the health officer, listen, somebody was here on Monday, look at the book, you are definitely not entering. But you see, I've got the muscle now to do that. Informal, if I go and register an office or I go somewhere and I'm trying to whatever, they hammer you. So there's a, a, a lot of things that, um, you know, that women face. Of course, access to finance is the usual one. You want to borrow money, give me collateral. And there's nothing better, I must say, that was developed for women um, in this sector than this mobile money. Because if you listen to the way they borrow, they borrow in the morning, by four o'clock, they've paid by midday because they've done their business. So now that we are getting more access to more um, creative tools, People are now able to, to put your, even your, your, your cooking at arena as um, security. And unfortunately, the, 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 the in, uh, sorry, okay, you're able to use that as security has improved. Of course, like I'm saying, because of the interest rate cap, um, that sort of has changed a little bit. But those are the ones I would really say that um, really um, challenge women. And of course, the biggest, the other one is networking. I don't have time to network in the evenings and get solutions to my problems and listen to the next big deal because I'm running home to cook, cook for my children. So those are really what I would say about, um, you know, informalities. Those are the, the challenges I would say women actually face. Thank you. Thank you, um, Flora, for that very comprehensive answer. And I think we'll be unpacking that uh, uh, some more later on in the presentation. So uh, moving on, next slide, to ideas around um, and, and the evidence around leadership and ownership in manufacturing. Over to you, Nduta. Thank you very much, Cleopatra. Uh, so with regards to leadership and ownership in manufacturing, we surveyed 100 manufacturing companies in the country, and uh, we wanted to understand issues around this area. Our findings, as you can see on our screens, are showed that majority of the female-led and female-owned companies had been in operation for less than 10 years. And uh, this could be an indication of the recent entry of women into the industry. Uh, manufacturing companies with more than 20 years of operation were either male-led or male-owned, uh, showing that men have been dominating in the industry for quite some time. 
we noticed that uh, newer companies, those, those ones that uh, had been in operation for between 11 to 20 years, had more females as compared to the older companies. Uh, this could also be an indicator of the changing trends with regards to female participation over the years and uh, the realization of uh, women's uh, contribution in workplaces by decision makers. So having uh, to integrate them more to participate within the industry. Uh, another finding is, uh, and this is a very significant one, is that in this study, companies that were owned and led by women had more women within the senior management and in the total workforce representation. Again, female-led companies, uh, be it multinational, be it those that were family at local and even at multinational level, so long as they were led by a female, they were three to nine times more likely to have at least a third of their uh, management and a third of their total workforce made up of women. Thank you. Your Patra, back to you. Thank you, Nduta. So as we're seeing, uh, there were different uh, models of leadership that we looked at. Looked at. Uh, like Nduta has mentioned, we, we surveyed uh, women who had founded the companies, women who were leading companies that may be local companies, women who were leaders in, multi, in multinational companies, as well as women who are leaders in family uh, businesses, and then those who had actually founded and grown their own businesses. And, and it's great to see the more women we have in leadership, the more women we see in our workforce and senior management. So touching on that, my next question is to Tajal. As a woman who's leading a family owned company that was previously run by a man, and this is a company that has been in existence for a very long time, what have, what have been the challenges you've been facing in diversifying your workforce? Over to you Tajal. Okay, like for me, the space in which I'm working in is a very, very challenging one because it's, a it's in the textile industry. And in Kenya, we had 52 textile mills in the 1970s and we're now down to three. And although it is a big four agenda now and we're trying to revive the textile industry in the country uh, from cotton all the way to... For me, I, I, to be honest, my focus has not really been women and I'll be honest about it, you know, and uh, my focus has been, I have to get past this storm that I'm in where I have workers who are almost 700 of them, I have cotton farmers and the market is so challenging with the second hand, which has not been there, which has been there, not today, it's been there for a while, you know, and um, also with not just the second hand, but also with uh, China. We compete head on with China, imported fabrics, imported. So my, this is Tika cloth mills and this is China. You have to match. Tajal, I think we've lost your sound. Would you mind uh, turning off and turning on your microphone again, just so that we can test that your sound is back? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Go ahead. Great. So the challenges for me have been a little bit more tricky and I haven't really thought about uh, women so much, but I did go to one of your one women organizer and I realized, oh my God, I'm doing nothing. And I went back and I made sure I got the women into manufacturing. And uh, we we are trying to do more and more and, you know, like, when I first went to my HR manager, he said to me, no, no, you know, I'll need toilets for women. I said, what's the problem? Put the toilets, you know? You know, we have night shift and we shouldn't have women at work at night. I'm like, what's the problem? The women, if the women want to come at night, why can't you just let them come, you know? And uh, yeah, so now we do have a number of women and they're pretty well settled actually. And we even got a shop steward who is a woman, which is great. And uh, the men have really accepted this and now they're really beginning to see that the women are there and uh, took them maybe a bit of time. Um, another challenge I'm having is I, I move from the number of employees, you know, once somebody's employed, you can't tell them, please leave because I want to replace you with the woman, you know. So unless I grow at a very good rate or a very fast rate, I'm still constrained with the amount of women I can bring. I have to have the space for the women, you know. Thirdly, it's heavy, it's very heavy duty um, manufacturing. So lifting heavy things, you know, this is very challenging for women because 
physically women are not able to lift these heavy bales and these heavy uh, beams and uh, you can imagine if a woman is expecting and she suddenly does something like that, she could even have a miscarriage. So moving forward, we really need to think very clearly, what are the women more, where are they gonna fit better and better? And the more we think about it, the places where the women are gonna be more settled, where they're gonna be more happier, where they're gonna be more, they're gonna grow more, they're gonna grow better. There's no point in putting a woman in a place where she doesn't belong or putting a man in a place where he doesn't belong, you know? And women and men are very, very different. And uh, the, any good company needs the women and it needs the men because it brings balance. Just like a family needs a woman and it needs a man. It brings balance, balance in thinking, balance in um, the way things move. And I found myself as a woman really crying out, really, really crying out for the manufacturing sector, that there needs to be change. We need to look for ways of developing our manufacturing sector. And this is why we went for the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya, because to compete with China head on, one on one is a very difficult thing to do. With the Buy Kenya, Build Kenya, maybe I have some sympathy coming through and saying, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. We want this product, not just because of quality, the quality is there, yes. The price is not bad, yes, but because we want to develop our own economy also. We don't want to be dependent on importation all the time, whether it Thank is you. textile or whether it is anything else. So I agree, I have to do much more on the women front and I still want to do a lot more on the women front, but uh, right now my challenge is a little bit more than just looking at the women, it's looking at everyone, yeah. Thank you. I think, I think that's a very sobering thought as we're all here, um, our participants, our audience, we really are, are pushing the mainstreaming gender and inclusion agenda. We also have to realize that it's a difficult um, environment in which manufacturers are, are operating, especially even now uh, with, the, with the global recession, it becomes even harder for, for, for many of us. So, now thinking about what you've mentioned and what, what, you, what you said about, you know, women may not have the skills, are they in the best place? I'd like to direct my next question to Irene. Uh, Irene, as, as a woman who has been in the construction sector and who has grown through various roles uh, to the point where you established your own business, do you think that our training institutions are doing enough to develop the skills of our workforce and women in particular for manufacturing? Thank you, Irene. Thank you very much, uh, Cleo. It's really an honor to be here. And uh, good evening, good morning to everyone who is uh, participating today. Um, so in regards to the training, um, I think that I would say both yes and no. Yes, because we find that we now have access to education and then we have the TVET programs that are really trying to uh, make sure that we have proper skilled uh, workforce. But on the other hand, you find that education in itself being an ecosystem should be multifaceted in the sense that um, you have the education, the normal brick and mortar, but we should also have beyond the classrooms, the integration on the job market practice. So you find that in most uh, learning institutions, they are not coming back and saying that what is the industry really uh, requiring? What are the industry requirements? What policies do we have in regards to internship that we are making sure that we have the, our students who are still going through these internship programs so that we have more um, updated technologies? I remember we brought in a machine late last year and we because of COVID, we couldn't get the manufacturers to come here and train our technicians. And we were going around uh, to NITA, to different other uh, places and saying, we need technicians to come and operate this machine. But most of them were saying, hey, this one, it's so upgraded. We don't know uh, the technology yet. So there's really a gap that is there that, um, that we must address. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. And now I would have had a lot more questions for the panelists on this on this issue around um, leadership, uh, ownership and uh, developing skills in the workforce. But I think we're going to have to move forward. And if we can pick up some of the time um, as we move forward, I will go back to some of the questions uh, that, that, that I wanted to ask the panelists. So next slide, please. 
Next slide. So we're going to be talking about women's participation and uh, some of the challenges and opportunities that have been mentioned, uh, some of them by the, by the panelists. So over to you, Nduta. Thank you, Cleo. Uh, so uh, we wanted to understand women's participation from a system point of view. And uh, for this, we used an ecological model, as you can see on that, the circular model that's within the, the slide. And we identified three uh, main layers which can be used to describe women in manufacturing. The inside layer consists of individual and societal factors uh, that could either be um, opportunities or challenge for, for women. The middle layer consists of business or organizational related factors. And the outer layer is composed of policy factors. Now, uh, within our analysis, we found that the factors across the three layers contribute as either ecology challenges or opportunities for women in manufacturing. For example, if we look at the policy factors and uh, where we have seen most of our policies and laws are gender neutral, uh, based on our earlier, uh, earlier slide, there is opportunity for various actors such as parliament, the gender commissions on equality, uh, business member organizations uh, to action and uh, to pull together and develop guidelines for effective implementation uh, of these guide of the, the policies uh, where they exist or to develop uh, policies where they are lacking. And this also gives room to advocacy engagements on gender issues uh, where it comes to women participation in economic activities such as manufacturing. Now the lack of skills of uh, skill set within manufacturing is a big one at uh, the individual level. And this study noted that there exist uh, numerous opportunities. Uh, for example, we can be able to socialize our girls and young women towards uptaking STEM courses to ensure that they enroll, they are retained, and they actually complete these courses to be able to gain the requisite knowledge and the skills that can be able to make them competitive and to be able to also make them thrive and be productive and competitive within the industry. As you will notice, uh, we have as many challenges as we have for opportunities. So every challenge can actually be translated into an opportunity. And this is a, a call for all the women within manufacturing to be able to identify these and to action. Thank you, Cleo, back to you. Thank you, Ndutsa. Now over to our panelists. Now throughout the the conversation that we've been having you've touched uh, all of you on some of the obstacles or the challenges and some of the opportunities that you see um, for improving the participation of women in manufacturing and betty i'd like to start with you from a development perspective why is it difficult to build smes into large enterprises in kenya what is the issue that we have? What can be done in the policy and regulatory frameworks as well as the, cap the capital market to grow women-owned women, women -owned enterprises? Over to you, Betty. So thank you very much. Uh, one of the things that we must agree to do is to work together uh, through commitment and just hard work uh, that's already been put in by women in manufacturing. So we must all agree that we need to put in concerted effort uh, by all stakeholders so that then we can be able to address uh, the limiting factors that are working against uh, women in manufacturing. We must also be willing to invest uh, capital finance. Uh, we must be able uh, to build uh, business capacity through gender lens investing. Uh, we must also uh, be willing uh, to make sure that uh, we are also uh, providing business incubator and accelerator programs that allow uh, for women in manufacturing to grow. Uh, like was mentioned earlier, we must also address the gap that exists in STEM education. Uh, bringing in young women is important, so mentorship and sponsorship opportunities are key. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. And, um, and touching on that, uh, on what uh, Betty has said around um, investing in, in, our, in our enterprises here locally. I'd like to ask you, Irene, 
what have you seen as the key obstacles in Kenya's policy and regulatory framework that actually are keeping women out of, of manufacturing? We've mentioned a whole host of, of, um, of issues, but what is particular to the policy and, and regulatory framework in your opinion? Thank you. Thank you, Tim. So first, I would like to say that I think in Kenya, we are really making strides. We have one of the best, I mean, one of the best and robust policies and uh, guidelines in towards uh, inclusivity, gender inclusivity, but something still uh, really taking us back, like I would say social and cultural uh, norms. I've seen that this really hinder uh, participation uh, of women in manufacturing because it's we still have that problem where women are seen more as uh, primary caregivers so you find even in manufacturing uh, sector even though they have the same skills as um, let's say a man would have but they are more asked to do maybe marketing jobs or they would be asked to serve some tea instead of getting equal opportunities so we have to start breaking this uh, uh, some of these barriers and saying that yes I'm a woman and yes, but I'm still able to, to, to carry out this work. We also need policies that um, we know address uh, board governance and having representation for women in boards uh, because it's happening in blue chip companies. But what about in the semi sectors? We really don't have a lot of that that's going on. Uh, we another challenge I've seen that is uh, there is. Uh, to markets you know, in areas, but in urban areas is not where we are having manufacturing taking place. And where it is, is that you find that when the women go there and find out where plants are or manufacturing venues are located, they say, hey, hey, uh -uh, here I can't come back, it's too far. And look also at various other initiatives, like the AGPO initiative is there, um, but some people don't know that it's even available. So we need to have civic education for everyone to know what is accessible to them, and so they tap into it. Thank you, thank you, Irene. You've actually touched on, um, on some of the social uh, factors that might inhibit uh, women from actually fully engaging. And, and for Margaret, do you, are you finding even in, um, as a woman uh, owner, as, a, as, the owner of a, uh, as the owner of a manufacturing um, company, are you still finding that even with female leadership and, and also touching to what Tijal has said, that women are segregated in certain jobs and positions in manufacturing? And what can we really do to increase the number of women leaders and owners in manufacturing? Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Cleopatra. Um, I couldn't agree more with Irene and Betty with what they have touched on. Um, I'd like to bring in an aspect that um, probably is not, uh, has never been quite addressed. And, and I call this the imposter syndrome. Um, this is the constant feeling of uh, inadequacy or feeling like you're not good enough. And whenever I'm dealing with the women that work, work with me, work for me, they always have the impression like when you try and give them a task that is above what they normally do, probably they're only involved in grading, they feel like they're not good enough to do a bigger task. And I feel like this is, um, it's, it's a well-studied syndrome, but it is something that also the stakeholders need to come in and try and address, literally hand hold the women and pull them out of that um, cocoon of feeling like I'm not good enough to stand out or I'm not doing the best thing. Uh, the other thing I noticed, which has also been mentioned by the other, the other panelists, is um, the unmatched skills. Uh, yes, we have talked about the technical institutions and all that, but they, they come out, they have studied something in STEM, but it is totally irrelevant to currently what the industry is looking for. So that kind of linkage between this, the industry and um, the technical institution needs to go beyond just um, interactive to even being participatory in terms of deciding the curriculum because they are completely, like Irene mentioned, they're completely new skills that are coming into the market. And sometimes we are forced to look for these skills outside the country. And it's unfortunate that you have to literally look out people or women, not necessarily women, but also women and men who could be able to do the same job. 
So here on the ground, we really feel like total disconnect. But for me, the first thing that I felt that the women always never wanted to stand out because they have the feeling like they are inadequate or they are not good enough. Uh, I must commend what the institutions like USAID and, and the other organizations and also the ICRW WIM are doing right now. I think it needs to reach out to more women um, that are um, actually doing very good things in the back in the village, in the cities, and they need to be handheld and told that you're doing what you're doing is really, really wonderful because they always have a feeling like it is too small, it is nothing, it is inadequate. And this is something that can really get the women out of these dark corners. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Margaret. Yeah. And now coming on from that, that last comment that you, that you made about there's a lot of work happening. There are a lot of uh, women who, are, who may be um, running informal businesses. I think my next question now will be to Tajal. So, with a large and uh, established enterprise, how are you? In, how are you integrating these maybe these SMEs and um, maybe some more more informal um, uh, enterprises in your supply chain? And are you making? While you've said you haven't made deliberate efforts within your staff or your workforce to bring uh, women on board, uh, what are you doing? Are you doing anything, or do you have any deliberate efforts to increase the number of women in your supply chain? Thank you, Tajal. Yeah, so, okay, my supply chain, uh, my last year, two years, I focused a lot on the cotton front, you know, so I went all the way to Homa Bay, I went all the way to Siaya, I went to Yata and um, Pekatoni, and I, I addressed lots of farmers, and it was very interesting to see that in some regions, the women were really shining, and they wanted to grow the cotton. In other areas, there were just no women in the, in the, in the room. And it actually showed which areas had women who are more, are more proactive and where the women were more suppressed in the villages. This is in the villages. And I actually asked the question, where are the women? You know, and there were two women in the room and they said, you know, here are the men on the land, you know. So I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it will come. With time it will come, it will happen, right? But on the other front, where I'm supplying a lot of garment factories, I supply a lot of small scale garment factories. The amount of women that are in the garment sector in Kenya is phenomenal, you know, they can stitch, they can even stitch from home, it's so easy to do. And we have seen that so many women have started these businesses, having six machines, having 20 machines, and they're all interested to grow. And I've had such beautiful stories come on my table where they said, I started with two machines and now I'm on 10 machines. I started with 30 machines and now I'm actually making even mattresses. I'm no longer making only uh, stitching, I'm actually gone one step further and one step further. And I've seen these women really progress and it's so encouraging. And I'm so excited about it because I think Kenya, honestly speaking, I think the, Kenya, the Kenyan women are very dynamic. There may not be a lot of space for them sometimes, but they make their space and they don't necessarily make a lot of noise about it. They just get up in the morning, they get to work and they do what they need to do so that they can get things moving. And I, I think it's fantastic, really, really fantastic. And I also believe that women in manufacturing, why is manufacturing great for women? Because manufacturing is not something that you come in one day and then you're out the next day. Manufacturing needs discipline, it needs loyalty, it needs um, commitment. And these are the attributes of women. Women are loyal, they're passionate, they're really good at all these things. So they, they're much more successful at manufacturing than men are. Whether we found the space yet, that's a different, uh, we may not have found enough space yet for the women, but as we find the space for the women, you, you can see the women businesses growing in a really fantastic way. And I should say Kenyan women should be very proud of themselves, very, very proud of themselves. Keep going, you, you speak success actually. Kenyan women speak success. And I really feel encouraged by it so, so much. Thank you, Tajal. Uh, that's 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 great. I hope I answered your question. Well, you you did, um, but your passion as well for Kenyan women in manufacturing came through. So uh, I think I think you did. We still have a way to go uh, from 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 the comment that you've made. Um, 
And now also touching on that, um, Flora, uh, as opposed to maybe Tajal, who has had some difficulty on I'm, including I'm women um, in, her, in her enterprise. Uh, for Flora, you actually mentioned at the top of this uh, of this. No, webinar. I wanted to ask you the same question. Did, when, did you feel this when you went to do your survey, that the women are coming up, coming up at a very fast rate? I think we'll answer that. We'll answer that um, um, in the recommendations because Nduta does speak to, to that, that women are coming up. But I think now I'd like to just ask one question of Flora and we'll address that in the recommendations to Dajal. So um, Flora, uh, with, with what you said at the top of this call, um, women, uh, women being great uh, when you have them on boards um, and, and also having to look for information on your own as a woman. Uh, I'd, like to know, I'd like to know from, from your experience and from the 25 years of, um, of running um, Melvin's March, what specific gender inclusive policies you have put in place in your company because uh, from the work we did, we saw that you're almost 50% uh, female and 50% male in your workforce. So it would be great to hear what the gender inclusive policies have been. And also for you to let us know what returns on your investment, what, what the returns on that investment have been. Over to you. All right, thank you very much. And um, of course, being a female, you can imagine when I go to recruit or when I go to, to do anything, um, it doesn't really matter to me whether you're a male or a female. So for me, I think the first time this was drawn to my attention, we were doing a research with, I think, IFC, and they came and said, what's your male to female? Unfortunately for me, it was, it was um, something like 55 to 45 to the women. And I guess that's because I didn't look through a lens of just male only. And what is also interesting is we've remained like that. And we even have a lot of women, I think even in our top management, it's, it's still, it's actually a 60-40 split. So perhaps I can be accused of going the other way of um, so much inclusivity that um, I basically do not, in, um, you know, I basically look out for men. Because I do know there are some jobs, especially the meticulous things, I do tend to find I, I trust women more because they, they are non, they're non-assumptive. They think things through. They come back with feedback. Whereas you tell some, a man something, he's like, yeah, 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 I think I've got it. So, but for me, really, it's, a, it's just really having non-discriminatory behavior, non-discriminatory um, language. I remember when the government brought in the three months um, maternity leave, that and, and you can add a one month. I remember some people going on radio and said, well, let's just not hire the young women. And of course in my business, because sales and merchandising tend to be a lot of women, um, there's a point I, I sat back and I said, my God, are we just a breeding ground? But again, being a woman and I got my children as in the business, I give them their four months and I just say, you know what? This just comes with the territory. But what you tend to find when we come, when we come to look at the ROIs you're talking about is that um, you get a lot of uh, commitment. People you know, connection, you know, I remember a lady the other day, she, she, she went for her four months, came back, she's showing off her baby, she's so proud. And, her, and during her uh, maternity, it was actually difficult for us because she dropped the ball so much. And I'd, I'd laugh and tell everybody, I've been there, I've done that, I've worn that t-shirt, she'll be fine when she gets back. And true to the word, so you do build a, a much stronger employer brand, of course your compliance, um, their behavior, you know, are much, are much more loyal. But I also must say, I do feel women are very good employees, really, really, genuinely. And especially with these days when we're fighting a lot of ethical issues, I do tend to find that um, you um, having women on board or, or to together with you does help. And the final one is around the softer skills. When we are changing policy and saying one or two, three things, I could perhaps just be talking because I heard it from someone and, and a woman will just say no, but that doesn't work for the women. You know, that does, those hours don't work for the women. So what I do is I say, like I think um, Tejal said earlier, throw it out there. If they wanna pick it up, fine. If they don't, I will never discriminate you because you can't come to work on a particular day or something, or you, know, you can't do certain hours. Thank you. I hope that answers that, your question. That, yeah. 
Yes, you have. Thank you. That's that's a, that's a great answer. And now to my final question uh, before uh, Duta shares the recommendations, recommendations and we go into question and answer. We've managed to make up time five minutes behind, but I, I hope you'll all bear with me. So Naomi, uh, with all, everything you're hearing all the way from um, the, the needs that women have uh, for finance, uh, issues around collateral, there are, there, they have mentioned training, um, they have mentioned uh, technical skills. Uh, there's been a whole host of, of, um, of issues, challenges, and also possibilities that have been mentioned by these women here in manufacturing. So from the financial perspective, and are there any women specific financing products that are being developed for these more resource intensive settings and sectors? Because like Tejal has said, you need the money to do this work. Irene has mentioned it, so has Flora. So what are our financial institutions doing uh, about that? Thank you, over to you, Naomi. Thanks, Cleo. And I think that's one very uh, emotive conversation when it comes to, um, financing uh, businesses. Um, I dare say uh, that banking is generally gender neutral, but it is more, um, it leans more to um, supporting men in the sense that the banking model was developed by men for men. So that's one thing we need to really accept. And so a lot of the lending policies and methodologies are very restrictive and do not favor women. So I think um, the one thing that uh, is, is work to do for a lot of financial institutions, bearing in mind that there are very few known financial institutions that have remodeled their business to incorporate the needs of women, uh, I, I believe there is work to do just uh, from the, the, the review of lending policies, the review of even regulatory um, requirements, because, for example, for like I said, for you to get a sizable amount of, of credit, you require collateral. And this is it's not um, a, a requirement of banks, it is actually a requirement of the regulator. So um, <clears throat> such things, such policies need to be reviewed. But as, as, as we speak, there are a few um, uh, uh, products in the market that are um, developed for women and um, they may uh, not require some of this um, like collateral, but they're not, they're not, um, they may not give you a, a sizable amount of money. And so for the, for the manufacturing sector, which is very capital intensive um, and for women to benefit a lot of these policies need to be uh, relooked at and um, and come up with more gender uh, gender um, inclusive uh, products, uh, not necessarily uh, women products. I know there have been some financial institutions that came up with very specific women products, and they and the, and the, and they were marketed as pink products, and and they didn't do very well because. From surveys, women have said they want products that are the same as the ones men are 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 being offered. However, their needs need to be needs need to be addressed. And so, I think, uh, in terms of coming up with products, there are products in the market um, uh, that are that are uh, uh, geared for women. Uh, but there is a lot more work to do to make the gender uh, inclusivity within banking. Um, but that said, I think, the, like I said earlier, there are more uh, opportunities for non-financial um, opportunities uh, for women to engage in and be able to upskill themselves uh, to be able to compete with men uh, in those gender neutral, gender neutral products. A lot of networking, a lot of mentorship, a lot of um, learning best practice amongst the women. I mean, I hear from Tejal, I hear from Flora, women who have succeeded. I think my challenge would be, how do we uphold the, the women who are coming up or women who would want to grow their businesses? How do we share your best practice with them and enable them take on the challenge to grow their businesses 
um, slowly to the to the level where yours have reached. So I think there is um, there there are products I can say that, but there is an opportunity to just um, make them even more available for women if some of these policies are are really looked at. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. And that's a good note to now hand over to Nduta. Can we have the next slide? Uh, so Nduta is going to take us through the recommendations. Uh, next slide, Joe. Next slide. Over to you, Nduta. Thank you. Thank you, Cleopatra. Thank you to all the panelists and to our audience this far. Uh, now we are at, at the tail end of our presentation. And uh, we are looking at recommendations uh, for both policymakers and development partners. And for us, as the study team, we feel that uh, these recommendations can uh, be able to remove a lot of the barriers that the, the study has uh, highlighted and also what our panelists have been speaking about and can also be able to help us enhance the opportunities for women in manufacturing. Uh, with regards to the policymakers, we feel that like uh, the study identified that a majority of our laws and the policies around uh, uh, the manufacturing sector are gender neutral. We need to move with haste uh, and um, develop guidelines that can be able to help us implement uh, gender transformative um, policies uh, for the sector. Uh, we also need to increase STEM campaigns, uh, awareness campaigns, especially within the rural and uh, both the rural and urban areas to be able to encourage girls and young women to uptake these courses so that they can easily be inculcated into the system, be able to attain the skill set, the knowledge that they require to be able to compete with the men in the industry. Uh, we, at policy level still, there's need for us to lobby for targeted financial incentives and uh, tax exemptions for women-led and women-owned companies. And uh, this is something that the private sector can actually champion and uh, make it very vibrant so that uh, uh, it can support the women-led and the women-owned uh, businesses. Uh, next, uh, for the development partners, uh, there is a lot of opportunity for us to um, come up with funding initiatives that could help us to further this research and even more research, be able to come up with interventions and uh, build evidence that can be able to inform and uh, propel and promote women's entry and advancement in manufacturing. At the same time, Funding opportunities can also enable us to create dialogue spaces for policy actors and stakeholders to come together to exchange. And with this, within these settings, they could actually discuss some of the policy gaps and be able to implement uh, practice recommendations for the sector to make it more successful. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now, for the business owners, we need to ensure that our human resource policies, especially within the manufacturing companies, um, are gender transformative to be able to increase productivity, to increase uh, profitability and performance. Uh, so we need to ensure that um, our HR policies have equity in terms of gender, in terms of hiring, in terms of promotion, retention, and allowing growth for both men and women. We also need to conduct uh, needs assessment to keep um, improving on our performance with regards to gender uh, equality attainment and uh, do this consistently and uh, regularly to be able to ensure that we are in uh, the right place. As we've seen the business case for women uh, representation within the, the industry cannot be overemphasized. Now, uh, women are uh, coming up and are now realizing that they need to speak for themselves. And uh, for this, we need to ensure that we can leverage their individual strengths uh, through networks, through associations, to amplify their, uh, their, their voices, especially the workforce, ensure that they can be able to highlight that the things they are not happy with, with regards to how uh, we manage our companies. For the business owners also, coming uh, together to be able to, to forge ways and pathways on how to access markets, how to, to be more proficient within with technology and how to obtain um, available government-led uh, incentives. Now, uh, like we know that uh, women are the main consumers within the, the market. And uh, in most instances, they are, they are, the decision to buy or not to buy lies with them, even within the household. 
So you can imagine how much uh, that ability to be able to make such decisions and to influence decision making within a company, how profitable that would be for the company. And uh, uh, that's why we need to ensure that we increase on their numbers and also ensure that uh, the women who already have experience can be able to mentor those who do not so that they can uh, continue to thrive within the industry. Thank you. Back to you, Cleopatra. Thank you, Uta. Uh, Tajal, I think we answered your question. We are seeing a lot of women coming up there. Next slide. So we have had a lot of questions coming in from the audience and we are already uh, one or two minutes over time. No, one minute over time. So I am going to have to select just two questions and, um, and I would like to direct you, there'll be a slide coming up for those uh, who still uh, would like to communicate with the study team or the panelists, you can always w uh, email Wim Kenya. But let me now go to, to two of these questions from the audience. I think there's one uh, here from Gloria, and this is to Phyllis Wakiaga. I hope, Phyllis, that you're back online because we missed you uh, um, uh, a bit uh, uh, a while ago. So the question from Gloria is, our governments often provide incentives this is uh, like tax waivers or holidays to big investors. Why can't the same be done for small businesses? The tax and regulatory requirements are punitive and push many to remain under the radar. This is again, touching on that issue of informality. Over to you, Phyllis. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I've been listening in. I just had one uh, issue to attend to but uh, I think the session has gone quite well. Yeah, so in terms of small business, uh, those are challenges that are real. Uh, in the country, we have looked at our small businesses and we do realize that the support provided for small businesses um, can be enhanced uh, because uh, if you look at the ability of businesses to graduate from the micro, small, to become medium or even large enterprises, there's a very low rate of graduation and countries that have succeeded have had very deliberate SME support programs. Uh, within government, we have institutes like KIRD, the KIEs, um, and the other programs that are supposed to support small business. But over the years, they've increasingly um, not either been funded adequately or had suitable programs to support small business. As the association, what we have done, we've put in place an SME hub for manufacturers because uh, we've taken into, um, into recognition these different challenges the SMEs in manufacturers are facing. And we have a program that is supporting the incubation, acceleration, and scale uh, of manufacturing SMEs. And we are working with uh, different partners to see if we can get additional support that can offer deliberate uh, and a very intentional incubation and acceleration support to SMEs. So kindly reach out to us and uh, we'll be willing to uh, share with you and also get your views on how we can enhance some of the work we're doing in this area for SMEs and especially women, because a lot of them are caught up in informality or remain quite small for a period of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. And uh, I'm very happy that you could give us some insights into that. And as she has said, uh, we should, uh, for any further questions, uh, you, can, you can contact Cam. So many questions here, but there's one that I think is um, is quite interesting that I will I will go for, and this is a question from Julie uh, Noble, uh, and it's addressed to um, I'm addressing it to Tajal. Um, you mentioned uh, women uh, women maybe not having the strength or the skills to um, to do certain jobs in, um, in, your, in your sector, in your factories. But are you now finding that with increased automation, women can, can have increased opportunities in these technical areas? Over to you, Tajal. Yeah, yeah, I think for sure. I mean, women can do, can do even better than I'm telling you right now. For, to the women I'm speaking, I want to tell you one thing. There's nobody that's going to say, oh, let's put, give you preference, why? You know, at the end of the day, you're a mother, you, you know, they carry more stress having a woman in their business. It's the, you've got to fight your way and you've got to find your way. That's what I have to say about it, you know. And I say even more, become a business owner. 
look at the business opportunities. The Buy Kenya, Build Kenya is now being pushed by our government in a big way. Look for your space to work in, find it and do it for yourself. You don't have to be employed by somebody all the time. But yes, I agree. I do agree that, you know, we have to, what, I'm just talking about the very intensive, labor intensive, like carrying heavy weights and things like this. Honestly speaking, if you're expecting a baby and you have to carry a weight, you don't even know you're expecting and suddenly you get a miscarriage. I mean, it's not practically possible. I'm just talking about the real extreme this side and the real extreme this side, which is you can have a sewing machine and when your baby's sleeping at night, you can sew some clothes. You know, those, those are the two extremes and you can work from home, you know. You can find your space anywhere in the middle of that. And there's space everywhere in the middle of that, you know. So there's lots and lots of opportunities. And I'm not saying that they can't, the women can't. Let me tell you, the women can. And you, you will see in manufacturing, like I said, what drives manufacturing? It's passion. It's you know what people want. You know you're, now you, you've got to buy Kenya, build Kenya, so you can do something on that front. And you, have, you can manufacture it here. Why do you want to look at you look at manufacturing, a, a man, women stay. Once you're in something, you stay there and you fight it out, you do your work. So you're, you have already a big plus plus in manufacturing and you will see, I'm telling you, I'm seeing it. The business owners that are buying the fabric from us, the women are growing phenomenally and it's growing. Women businesses are growing. And I really feel that women should not, don't worry about, um, a man is not going to, if he has to, one third, he will do the one third, but he's not going Thank to, you. right? So push yourself. That's what I have to say. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Tadal. And our final question is Tunduta. Um, a question from Angela Nyamu. Uh, what were the costs of corruption in, or, um, in keeping women in the informal economy? Over to you, Nduta. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, corruption did come up um, a bit, although it was not uh, uh, something that we, we focused on in detail. Uh, and of course, as we know, corruption as also within the other sectors, there's a lot of uh, uh, risk towards, towards the same. Uh, so uh, many business owners and uh, who, women who are manufacturing, uh, alluded to the fact that the cost of compliance and uh, the overlapping agencies that were required to enforce compliance and a bit of the regulatory um, work uh, sometimes pushed them towards corruption in terms of uh, um, getting the enforcers uh, not to, to close their businesses and uh, to give them more time. But I would say this is not something that we followed on more in detail, but it is something that, is, that came up within the study. Uh, so um, I think the, the formalization would actually get us to, to the next stage. If we can be able to formalize our businesses, ensure that we're able to follow on the, all the requirements, ensure that we have our right senses, our compliance standards right. And I think then we do not need to go into the, the business of corruption. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Njuta. And so now on to the next slide. I think now we are 10 minutes over. I need to let you go for the rest of your day. I'd like to say a big thank you to the panelists. I would have loved to continue this conversation. Uh, thank you for, for all your, um, your insights and your participation in this study. I'd like to thank uh, the CEO of CAM, uh, as well as uh, the CEO of ICRW. Uh, thank you for your, your remarks and support uh, that was provided for this study. Uh, and Duta and the rest of the study team who are online right now, uh, looking at the questions, collating all this information. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you. It was great uh, leading this team. For our communications team in DC, Joe, Lindsay, and everybody else who has, uh, who has helped uh, with the technical side of this webinar, uh, it's been great. Um, thank you again. 
And, um, and I'd just like to say that this is going to be the first on our reimagining series. So we will be having another panel, um, another webinar in a couple of months or so. And we will be inviting more of the women we spoke to. Let this be a, a dialogue that continues. Um, I can see that there will be more discussions on issues around informality, issues around access to finance. So this is an ongoing series that we will be hosting. And we also know that CAM, the Women in Manufacturing Caucus is also going to be hosting, hosting uh, a lot of events around uh, mainstreaming uh, gender and inclusion in the manufacturing sector. Should you have any questions, please feel free to send an email to wimkenya at icrw.org. Uh, you can always reach out to me at simujeni at icrw.org or uh, Nduta, who was uh, one of the key researchers at sngenda at icrw.org. Thank you all for your time. Have a good morning, a good day, a good evening, a good night, wherever you are. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Signing off now. Thank you.